Oh, hello. Thank you for joining me for this installment of Playbill's Stream Stealers. I'm Mark Pikert, Editor-in-Chief of Playbill, and today's special guest, and I'm already in love with her, uh, is Merle Dandridge, who you probably know best from Greenleaf, which is now on season five. Uh, she has a really exciting, I was telling her earlier, I'm such a nerd. I truly am. She's got a really exciting HBO Max series coming up called The Flight Attendant, which is based on a book, which I have absolutely read uh, and loved. And she's a huge, great Broadway resume, including Once on this Island, the recent Tony winning revival. And that's enough of me babbling. Let's have the luminous Merle Dandridge join us. Hey! Hi. How are you? I'm good, how are you? I hear you're trapped in LA right now. Yeah, I am. I came back just to go to a friend's event and uh, then everything shut down. So how's New York? Uh, New York is better today, but has been very sweaty. Very, mm -hmm. it's it's that stretch of the summer where you're like, really, Sticky. already? Sticky, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm excited to talk to you about all the things. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you about Greenleaf, but first I have to talk to you about The Flight Attendant, which is coming yeah. up on HBO Max. I love that book. That book is a journey. Mm -hmm. So who are you playing in The Flight Attendant? Well, uh, I play a character that is not in the book. What, what happened, what had happened was, uh, <laughs> so I had originally auditioned for one of the, one of the flight attendants that, um, it's a character that uh, Rosie Perez ended up playing, but they liked me so much that they were like, wait a second, there must be some place that we can use her. And they changed the head FBI agent from an older white dude to me. <laughs> no, stop yes. it. Yes. Which I thought was super cool that they just, completely retooled the entire character and and put me in the show. So I feel very honored, very lucky. And I mean, what a cool group of people. Oh my God. So, I mean, I assume things are kind of up in the air in terms of release date right now with yeah. COVID and filming and stuff. But The Flight Attendant, guys, if you have a chance, check out the book. It's really fun. It's about a flight attendant who wakes up. She's a problem drinker. And she, <laughs> she, she, she wakes up- She wakes up a cocktail. That, you know, it's it happens. <laughs> Especially in quarantine. I mean, uh, I don't judge. Yeah, cause cause uh, quarantine. Yeah, we. I mean, we're all drinking quarantinis every night. Okay. Uh, but we don't wake up with a corpse in our hotel room. Um, there's that. Yeah. There's that part. Everything is a yet, though. <laughs> You're hilarious. Uh, I stole that from Oliver Platt. He told me that one day. Like Do you have a bucket for that name that I just dropped, Oliver Platt? Do you want me to pick that up? Oh, I like it though. I like it. <laughs> how, um, how, I, I mean, all things aside, like I, I feel like every day is a oh, I didn't. Okay, it, it's going a step farther. Oh, okay, you know, every day we're we're riding the wave of of, of like oh, it's, nothing else could possibly happen. Did you see today that they've spotted a a new? flu that has the potential to become a pandemic in China? Yes, I saw that. So I just, I, I was like, what, what in the world? So anyway, all you people in Colorado and Oklahoma and Utah, I hope you're out there in the primaries, making sure we make some changes. Go and vote today. <laughs> Go vote, please. Go vote. Um, okay, so flight attendant is coming up. Uh -huh. Who knows when? It'll be our reward for getting through quarantine. That's precisely correct. Uh, and Greenleaf, season five, which is the final season, right? Yes, it is. Just premiered on OWN. And that's, I cannot believe it has been five years. I 2015, know. first the first season premiered. Mm -hmm. We, I mean, we were talking about this before. It's one of the great pilots. And it's a show that is so underseen and so smart and soapy in all of the right ways. Yeah. And just touches on so many fantastic characters and you get to see these different facets of these actors. I mean, we were talking earlier about Oprah Winfrey's character on the show, which is kind of like this. She's saucy, you know, yeah. she's in the bar. I was, 
I was going to say raunchy, but um, a little bit maybe. But not what, you, not what you would expect Oprah to be doing, like standing behind a bar with a dish rag, just wiping it down. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, but what has it been like? And it's your first lead on a television show as well. Right. So what has it been like just in terms of your own career and growth as a performer, getting to settle in with this family for five years? Yeah, it was... Every day was a huge learning curve for me. Every day was um, a new adventure. And, you know, being on Broadway, I, I think I was on the boards for a good 10 years straight. And you develop certain muscles to make sure that you can deliver the same material freshly every night, that you yeah. can um, maintain your physical health so that you can deliver the best show every eight shows a week, you know, and you have, you have the discipline of an athlete. And there is an, a different exercise in constant, well, not different, because I, I think in any kind of creativity, you need to show some vulnerability. But there is a, there was, a, there were a lot of different muscles because I had to go on a roller coaster with a character that is going through heaven and earth kind of trauma, had had gone through it, and now is going through it again in different ways. Yeah. And it's been, um, I'm like checking myself out because I, you know, doing my own hair and makeup <laughs> is like, I'm like, how, how much lipstick did I put on? Like, I've been in my mom's house, like, tall. All bets are off, okay? Anyway, <laughs> so uh, it was, it was a, a big learning curve because I had to be prepared for anything to happen. You know, I could be in the chair at four in the morning and my day's work, I probably had 10 pages to shoot and they would send me 10 different pages. And so, you know, you, you just have to be able to pivot on a dime, memorize quickly um, and be able to really digest that and put it out in a, in a meaningful way. And, um, you know, I've always been, I've always had like a blue collar work ethic. You know, it's really great. Um, the theater world, because you need every single person all the time and in and, and the same in TV. Um, but it's been really great to be in a, in a different kind of collaborative environment. Well, it's so interesting talking to the people who have really strong theater backgrounds who are now doing a lot of film and TV because it's, there might be this perception that like, Oh, they're, they're, Theater is so hard. They just want to go and do the the Lux film and TV stuff. But everyone that I've spoken to who has made that transition has the work ethic of a Puritan housewife. Yeah. Like you're basically Laura Ingalls Wilder on the prairie, just nonstop work. Yes. It's and that is 100 percent doing theater. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And then I, I also found like Okay, I had for in theater. I had to, um, you know, like for example, like playing Aida. I, I couldn't speak before three or four o'clock. My friends are always just like, "Are you ever going to speak to us again? Are you ever going to?" And you know, this was like before text message was so. I was just about to say that. Like now, everybody just texts, but back then, it's like you had to pick up the phone, and or you had like the Nokia analog where you had to hit every button a few times to get a, you know a text out. Oh my gosh! So you know. I, being on vocal rest was a different kind of meditation, but um, in, in TV, you know, you shoot, it, it can be up to 16 hours a day. And then um, on the weekend, you need a day to recover, a day to look over the material and maybe um, look ahead at scripts ahead and see if there's any um, chat or collaboration to be done um, or conversation to have with the writers. And then the next day you do the work memorizing and making, your, making sure you're completely prepared for the week ahead. So it's a seven day a week, constant thing. And uh, whew, goodness gracious. No wonder you're excited to come and do Once on this Island. You got a little mini vacation. Yeah. Oh, I loved doing Once on this Island. I loved it so much. Being back in the theater. Oh, I, I freaking love Broadway. My heart's broken right now because everybody is, um, you know, know, out of work but for so long. What was it like coming back to Broadway, having a little bit more of a name from the TV stuff? Was there a difference? Did you feel different, like walking out on stage every night? Oh yeah, it's because I I got a you know we could interact with the the audience when they came in because we had a pre-show and I was walking around half naked with a goat, an, a live goat, yeah. and I would 
hear people like, oh my gosh, the pastor ain't got no clothes on. <laughs> Hilarious. Uh, but what, what I really loved was, so that was 2017. I think the last time I was on Broadway was spam a lot. So like 09, yeah. 10. So it'd been a few years, but I mean, not that long. Goodness gracious. And everybody was just like, oh, it's so, so great that I love it when TV people come to Broadway or, oh, well, welcome to Broadway. Welcome to Broadway. We're so happy to have him like chop. This is my home. I done been up on these boards. Like, no, ma'am. Yeah, I'm like, this is my sixth Broadway show. Are you kidding me? But people are acting like I've never done Broadway before. They're like, oh, you're good at this. Oh my gosh. You know, like, it's, it's what I do. And the other thing that was really cool was watching my coworkers who had no idea, my coworkers on Greenleaf who had no idea what my background was. And because my character on, on Greenleaf is a little, um, uh, you know, she she takes the blows rather than gives them a lot. You know, she yeah. does a lot of 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 sitting back and turning the other cheek. And all the characters that I play are in, on on the stage are just so forward moving and so you know ugh, that um, they'd never seen me sing. They'd never seen me own a stage like that. And and they had no idea who I was when we got. They were, their minds were just like <sighs> like so many of them came to um, opening night and they were just like I see you in a completely different light. A completely different life, but it's a, it's an interesting that those two worlds just seem to be completely separate, isn't it? Well, it's that weird thing too, because there's such there's such little respect given to the replacements who come in throughout long runs, mm. and there's such little institutional memory of the people who have been in shows, right? And so I feel. Like so many people get lost in the shuffle in that way, which is ridiculous because yeah. many times the people who step into a show as a replacement do the show much longer than the original star. Right. But what was it like? Because, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the only musical that you originated a role in was Tarzan. Yeah, I was, I originated Tarzan, but I was also in uh, Jesus Christ Superstar. That was, it only lasted like 10 months though. Um, but that was the first time that I ever got to do the Tonys and oh. yeah. That was a thrill. What was it like getting to do, getting to be in the room as one of the principals with Once on This Island versus um, even Tarzan? Because Tarzan is a Disney musical, so that's a whole other kettle of fish. <laughs> that's a different animal. Um, uh, it was, it was awesome. It was awesome. You know, Michael Arden is a good friend and, and an extraordinary artist, and he was uh, heading the the cause there. And the fact that his mind was already on. Uh, being flexible in our perceived notions about what these characters were going to be, that we everyone had to be creative, meaning that, you know, of course, my character originally played by a man, and Alex Newell played uh, a, a character originally played by a woman. Yeah. And, you know, so it was... There, there were all, so many things that were put up in the air that already made it interesting. But then when you actually put those things together, it was really, really thrilling. And one thing about me, though, is that especially when creating something and gender switching something, you know, that we had to play with keys. We had to play with who she was, where she came from. And I like to start from the very, very bottom and, and really invent the entire story. And I had I had an epic, I could have written a novel about Rosalind de Venture, who was the, you know, in her life and how she became Papa Gay. And- um, Well, you're and, in quarantine, you've got the time. What's that? You're in quarantine, you've got the time, write the book. I, I know, right, I know. But I did write kind of like a, um, a piece that anybody else who who walked through Papa Gay, you know, I, I gave it to, so you know, they knew what what my feelings were and how where I came from and how how much I cared for and and loved the character through this dark time because there is a it's, it was a redeeming story. Anyway, so I have to make a lot of mistakes, and it's important it's important to me in a creative process to make a lot of mistakes. So I know there were some people in that room that I'd never worked with before. And I and I had I knew there were some sideways looks because I screwed up so many times. There were so many run throughs. It was like this might not work. 
this might not work. But the thing is, is that I do that. That's my whole rehearsal process. I suck, I suck, I suck, I suck, I suck. And then boom, then I, then it's there when it's, when it's time to go. Um, and so I, ex and, and that's, that's a good lesson in life anyway. You know, anytime you fall oh. down, you're falling forward, you're moving forward. And, um, and that's how I like to approach, approach the process. And I uh, have to be patient with myself. My coworkers have to be patient with me um, because I'm, let me just tell you though, trying to figure out how to go from a uh, laid down position to standing up and belting full voice, you know, when I was hiding on that, on that boat, uh, laying down for like, it must've been 15 minutes. And then all of a sudden, like I'm in the middle of the show belting, you know, a, a high C like right out of the bat. I'm like, uh, I'm going to have to work on that. And then the breath control to sing while I was getting on that big old, and then being able to stand on the big old boat, get off the big old boat and not, slipping you know there were, there were so many things that i was so ginger with and they were like can you just like pop up the answer is no <laughs> and then but eventually i got there i got there and it was dynamic and exciting but it was a step-by-step -step process and we all have as creators we just have to be patient with ourselves and we eventually get there and so and all that to say experiences of my life i will treasure that for all time. I mean, that was one of the great revivals, I think. I mean, from oh. just from like in the in the round and the sand and everything else. And then Ar Michael Arden's like genius at looking at this existing thing. The arrangements, the orchestrations. Anne Marie Malazzo, oh, 16 part vocal harmonies. Unbelievable. You know, we, everybody's streaming different musical pieces and stuff like that. And we got together to do a couple. I think we did Human Heart and then we did something else. And I literally had to go back and find my voice memos. I was usually like Rent. I could probably get up on the stage and do Rent cold right now. I would uh, just just cold. I'd probably be able to get up there. And it's been I mean, it's been over 10 years since I've done it. It's been a long time, but yeah. I could cold in my sleep. I know, I know that show inside and out. This one, I was like, um, so for this part, I have to be sitting, standing next to Alex Newell for his cuckoo coos to know what, when I go uh, away, away, uh, you know, <laughs> it was difficult um, in, the, in the vocal department. Uh, but it was also exciting. And, and the artistry that Anne-Marie had, you know, she, she was so, she was so specific. Like in the very beginning, there is an island where rivers run deep. And I, the first thing I think I sing is kuru, 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 kuru. And, and she would sit there in my face and she was like, no, 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 like a bird just waking up. You're just waking up. Kuru, 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 kuru. You know, like, like, the, I mean, it was so specific and you can hear it when you, when you, when you would go there because the sounds would come from all over. We were all over in the round yeah. and, um, and everyone would be like, I'm, I'm a little bird singing that, but then across the way, you would hear another bird waking up, answering to it, you know? It, I mean, just, whoa! Go back I mean, and look at the album. It is, ev everything has that. And um, there was another one about um, the waking sunrise. Like, there wasn't like, use your full breast of all, well, well, it's, and then, you know, it was wonderful. I mean, the density and the layers of that entire production are yeah. just so, and I feel like it got credit at the time, but there is not enough credit to be given to that kind of genius and that kind of thoroughness. I totally agree. Did you get to see, um, Michael Arden put me in the um, the Lincoln Center, G uh, not Jesus Christ, what's it called? Technicolor Dreamcoat? No, I was I was uh, working that night, but it oh was, my god! Somebody somebody commented and said uh, they loved you as the Pharaoh. Yeah, <laughs> which was so exciting um, to be able to play like a Tina Turner, uh, Beyonce, J Lo. I have never in my life put on a sparkly leotard like that, and I got to shimmy and shake and do all of that. Be carried in down the aisle at, in at Lincoln Center in a litter with like four really hot guys holding me up. It was 
a dream come true to say the least. It's, <laughs> I mean, the, the talent was out of this world. Anyway, a, again, a gender switch to have a female pharaoh. And uh, that was Michael's idea. And it, when he called me with it, I was like, hell to the air. Hell to the air. I, I just, there's, there's so much, even though Broadway is ephemeral, um, you know, we're, we're seeing all these great things that are com- gonna come out in quarantine, like, you know, the Hamilton piece and, and so many different things that are, are being put on the air, but it comes from that work, that work of creativity, mm-hmm. building from the ground up and, um, and messing up, trying something new. And it takes years to develop these things, years. And then it's ephemeral, it's gone. So now, you know, I, I love that people are gonna get to see some of the, some theater that, you know, perhaps got recorded um, and have that experience and well, know it, how beautiful the artistry is. It's been very telling to see who has jumped on the opportunities of streaming and has created new work and yeah. been very like creative and inventive and the people who are just sitting back perhaps and not engaging in the same way. Right. I'm keeping notes. <laughs> funny. I, I did a um, one of those readings. We did an all black uh, blind spirit. Oh my God. I meant to ask you about that with Leslie Uggams. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> it was and was it Montego Glover too? Say what? Was it Montego Glover too? Yes. I it mean, was, it was, it was, it was. that is black excellence. Yeah, it sure was. I was actually telling my, my TV dad, Keith David, we were hanging out last week and I was telling him about it because, you know, sometimes I, I think Bly's spirit can feel like rote, you know, it's just in the catalog. And But already you, you change it up and you put, uh, you know, you, you, the, the culture's already going to be different, you know, putting black and Asian characters in, in those roles. And he was like, ah, oh, that I would be willing to see. <laughs> He's like, that. Sounds interesting. I it would one hundred percent go see that. It was. I hope that makes it to the stage next year. Oh my god, that would be a dream. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, we are running out of time. So, two final questions. Um, sorry, there is a reader question. Uh, would you ever go back to Once on This Island and revisit? I don't see why not. Um, it was hard on my body. It's very interesting to be in your mid forties and not in your early thirties or twenties and running and, and furthermore, the sand. Okay. You, you know, when I was first starting the big deals on the body were like the original Saigon and Lion King that had the rakes, you know, dancing on rakes stages. There, there weren't people having problems dancing in sand and water, you know, cause you have to deal with like, water temperature and then the sand gets cold so that it doesn't blow up because it has to be damp so it doesn't blow up and you know we inhale it and the audience inhale it when we dance and then the varied nature if you've ever the difference between running on pavement and running on sand you know what i'm talking about your body it's harder on your body and if you are trying to move and do all of these you know jarring movements and dance um you know, I'm still working out some of my low back pain. <laughs> it was, it was a lot. It's a, it was plus a, a goat. Plus a goat. Plus the goat. Oh, I actually miss the goats. They were, um, they were like my kids. They really were. And when I left to go, I think it was season. I left to go film season three of Greenleaf, and then I came back for the summer. They were baby goats when we started. And then they grew into teenagers. Mm-hmm. And Peapod, the younger one, when he saw me, he rammed me hard. And it was, and I knew I could see it in his eyes. He was so upset that I left him. And sure enough, as soon as I I got you know a moment with him, he was just cuddling me, and I was like, oh gosh, the babies! I can't Facetime the goats. You can't. You, well, <laughs> you could. I mean, you always could. I, I guess, but they they were so. Um, just a part of my my daily routine, and you know, I I spent time. Part of my warm up was going down and spending time with them in their pen before we went out, so that we could have time together, and that they would trust me, and they knew that anything that we were going to do on stage 
was, you know, I, I, we had each other, but I had to check in with them. It couldn't just be like, all right, dance, go dance. No, they, they were my kids. I mean, forget Haley and Isaac. Those goats were the real stars of Once in the Island. <laughs> um, they got all the press. Yeah, and those doggone chickens. Oh, if the chickens, named after the Dream Girls, by the way, if if one of them was having a moment and getting ready to lay an egg, just be like, oh, Dina can't go on tonight. She can't go on tonight. She's it's she's really suffering through this egg. You know, <laughs> it was like, ah! oh, the things we dealt with on the island. <laughs> um, all right, final two questions. Okay. Uh, my favorite two questions. Um, right now, what are some of the organizations that you would love to direct people to investigate and or donate if they're in a position to do so? Oh, very good. Um, the, the first one is one that I am personally very, um, I, I've, I've been with for quite some time. Uh, and it's called Harvest Home LA, and it provides housing and holistic care to homeless pregnant women. And one of the reasons why I think that is so important is because, you know, when we talk about things like um, diverting funds from, you know, like whether it's the, the idea of defunding the police or, or all that kind of stuff, the idea is that we have to be investing in our communities and our people. And often those homeless pregnant women are, are, are they're very often women of color. And, you know, we need to um, nurture our communities and our young people from the ground up. And this, the, what recently the uh, Archdiocese of, of LA has gifted Harvest Home an entire convent, which will triple our capacity triple it. And so I, I personally believe it's essential work to be able to um, uh, give pregnant women a home during quarantine. Not only that, but resources to get on their feet, get education, um, move forward, find their own, find jobs, find um, a, a home after, and um, just be part of the community. It's a very important organization. Um, I have to put my fundraiser link up on my, I'll put it up on my, on my social. Um, the other one is uh, NAACP Legal Defense Fund. I think that's very important. And um, I, I love my local chapter of Black Lives Matter. They are moving things forward and, and staying right in the middle of things um, while, uh, while there's so much, while there's so much unrest and so, so much uh, change that can possibly happen. So um, I love those. Color of Change is another great one. Mm -hmm. But um, Harvest Home, I really believe in what they do and their heart for people and is has always been been there and i'm personally i've personally been part of the organization for a long time and um i can i can tell you firsthand they're changing lives i mean a convent is that's that's incredible i know and the way that it was laid out it, it couldn't be more perfectly set up for you know the needs to like give give um each mom like we're gonna give them each their own farm sink so that they can be able to bathe their their child in their own private space, you know. And I mean, it's just that's incredible. That's great. Yeah. Um, and then my final question, which is my favorite question of the last four months, is what are you watching in quarantine? Ooh la la! What am I watching in quarantine? What am I watching in quarantine? Um, <laughs> I, have, <laughs> I have really uh, enjoyed going down the uh, Netflix K-hole, man. Uh, what have I watched? Uh, I loved My Brilliant Friend. I loved uh, Never Have I Ever, which I loved seeing a, a young person of color and just different, different, uh, a different way of, and, and, and charming and funny way of, of bringing um, a meaningful story. And uh, also the the juxtaposition of cultures that might not be understood in the general in, in the general uh, zeitgeist and in um, America, I loved that part because I definitely identified that being um, black and Asian growing up in Nebraska. So I loved that uh, Ozark. Um, oh, I loved revisiting all the Spike Lee joints. Uh, Malcolm X is, is awesome. 
uh, what else? Oh, I feel like I feel like like the the time's running out. <laughs> I really should do a timer. <laughs> Uh, what else have I really enjoyed? I'm really into the documentaries, but um, books on tape have been my jam because it's. I think it's important to get out, get some sun, walk around, get some oxygen, get your your body moving. And so, it, in in that time, it's been great to listen to podcasts like 1619 and Code Switch, and uh, books like um, uh, oh, what have been some powerful ones. Oh, I loved uh, Obama's Dreams from My Father. But reading reading has been one of my favorite things about quarantine, to have the time and space to read cover to cover, right? Yeah, me too. It's been... I, I don't have the train time. You know, you, I used to always read everything on the train. I know. Well, I used to have a job. I live in a story, and I used to work in Dumbo. So I would read, like, a book a week with mm -hmm. that commute. And now I work in Times Square. I mean, when I have a, an office to go to. And it's like 20 minutes, 20 minutes. I can barely get like, I can barely get a seat in 20 minutes, let alone open a book. Right. Right. I'll read. Right. It's a different world. It, are, so are essential workers, is it still just essential workers on the train? Uh, for the most part, but we are in phase two now. So that's restaurants and um, salons, all of those, all of those businesses okay. are, are open for business. Like dark roots, like somebody needs to get, some, I'm like, if I try to do a top knot, it looks like I put a blonde, uh, uh, just stuck a blonde bun on it because all of my, all of the blonde is gum. I'm telling you, that's going to be in all the fashion shows this season. It's <laughs> going to be just a lot of blonde ponytails and dark, dark on top. <laughs> that's the quarantine style now. That's, that's what 2020 has given us. <laughs> Among so many other things. Among so many other things. Merle Dandridge, that's all the time that I have for you today. Oh. And what a delight. I I think I love you. I love you back, Merle. I love you back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, guys, if you have not watched Greenleaf, please tune in and check it out. It's a really fantastic show. And keep an eye out for HBO Max's The Flight Attendant. And I will see you on Thursday at 4.30 when I have Dan Fogler, Tony winner Dan Fogler, joining to talk about all of his projects. Yeah, Until Never then, live tweet tonight. Hashtag Greenleaf. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>